Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the EICC and the latest in our Innovation Nation series, Innovation Space. Uh, this, this evening's theme is particularly fitting given uh, that this week is World Space Week, uh, the largest public event on the planet celebrating sp space exploration, uh, space science and technology. Innovation Space is part of the EICC's Innovation Nation series, uh, which has been designed to celebrate all things innovative in Edinburgh and Scotland, with our, rich, with our rich history in the advancement of science, technology and medicine. The story of Scottish aerospace and space is an area that holds exceptional interest to many people. We're therefore delighted to introduce two gentlemen at the very forefront of Scotland's role in this fascinating subject. Firstly, I'd like to introduce Stuart McIntyre, Director of Presswick Spaceport, to tell the captivating story of Scottish aerospace and space endeavour. Ladies and gentlemen, Stuart McIntyre. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, uh, thank you for inviting me over to um, give you hopefully a few words about what we're doing uh, in the west of Scotland, and really on behalf of all of Scotland, and for that matter, on behalf of the UK, uh, in terms of the space industry and uh, and the opportunities we have within that. Um, it's a uh, a story. Uh, aviation in Scotland is a story that goes back an awful long way, and. The roots of what we uh, achieve in Scotland is, you know, uh, you know, date back to well before the war. And in many ways, those roots that we have laid down in those days are the very same roots that give us the opportunity that we have today. The, as, we, as we began the Spaceport program, and I'll tell you a bit more about the, uh, you know, the, the timescales and the, the niceties of it in a minute. We, we had, to, we had to ground our project in that history, and the, uh, uh, the, the history of, the, of Prestwick and the history of Scottish aviation um, you know, becomes a key part of that. Today, the, the sort of mandate of the, of, the, of the speech today, the talk today, was the story of the spaceport bid and what the impact to Scotland will be uh, of that uh, if we are chosen. I like to think it's not a question of an if at all, I don't think there are any other solutions in the UK even that can begin to touch what we can offer in Scotland. A little bit about the history of, of Prestwick, and, and this becomes really important when it comes to the space bid, but Prestwick has its roots in the pre-war era of aviation, in the, in the, in the time of aviation when uh, aviation itself was its own pioneering adventure, uh, long before uh, anybody really thought of put a, putting a rocket on the moon? We were thinking about, you know, how can we fly across the Atlantic? And uh, and and I have the privilege that it's my grandfather who was the uh, one of the pilots on the Houston Everest expedition who flew over Mount Everest in 1933 in those days of early aviation. And it's relevant. It's relevant because it expresses a spirit and a passion about aviation and about new technology and about new frontiers. And, and he was able to uh, give reality to his passion in the formation of Presswick Airport that followed. And the, I'll talk a bit more about the airport, but it, it allows us, I think, in this iteration of that uh, new uh, frontier to capture this uh, sort of banner that we've been using in, this, in, the, in, in the spaceport, you know, first Everest, now space, pioneering aviation. And it is about pioneering aviation, and it's about carrying that continuity of engineering competence, engineering exploration, engineering development into this next phase in aviation. This slide was meant to be a little bit about me. I'm a Glasgow University aeronautical engineer, as is my father. Uh, my grandfather I, uh, you know, is a pilot, uh, was a pilot. Um, my career was at Presswick, and this slide really talks a bit actually more about Presswick than it does me. You know, that's a picture of a, of a, general, a general Electric engine in overhaul at uh, Caledonian Air Motive, uh, now GE Caledonian, one of Europe's largest engine repair shops. Enormous amount of engineering capability, 30 plus years of significant engineering uh, history in that plant alone. You see the Jetstream 31s and 41s of uh, Jetstream aircraft in the, in the early 90s. 
That's the Scottish Aviation Facility that was bought, uh, that was built back in the pre-war days. They're flying over the Palace of Engineering there that was at Bell Houston Park and carried down brick by brick to Presswick to become the largest uh, aircraft manufacturing and, and engineering hangar of its day. Um, you know, the, the, the engineering capacity of Presswick is, uh, you know, is second to none. You know, I, I, my personal background, although an engineer, was into sales and marketing, and I've been you know, in that around the world. But coming back to Presswick, um, it's clear that that's actually what's needed to, to grow this opportunity. The Presswick weather is a, uh, you know, is, a, is a key anchor. The reason it was built in the first place was because when they were, when they, when they were wanting to um, uh, start up flying training and increase the number of pilots in the, in the Air Force before the war, they were looking for places to do that. And Presswick had the weather. It took a long time to persuade people that it had the weather. There was an MP from Greenock on the, on the, uh, on the committee in London uh, issuing these contracts and could not be convinced for love and the money that, uh, that Presswick, the west of Scotland, was a good place for flying. But they got, it, they got it through in the end. And there's a picture that I think expresses the capacity of Presswick. There's a, you know, there's a heavy Antonov flying into Presswick of a morning and you see the weather. It expresses the sheer capability of the runway. Three kilometres, very heavy duty, concrete base. Only a wartime airport can have that. And uh, interestingly, none of the other spaceport contenders in the, in, in, in the UK have any of that type of capability. But what's the spaceport all about? Why do, we, what, you know, why do we have a spaceport project? Why are we looking for a spaceport in the UK? And of course, um, space, as we know, is a growing and booming industry. Um, you know, Steve will talk later about all of the, uh, all of the downstream opportunities in the industry, all of the things that can be done in space, all of the new uh, capabilities that depend upon material in space, satellites in space, different instruments, different uh, communication mechanisms, uh, all, of, all of those incredible technologies in which we are strong in Scotland. Um, but the real problem we have in the UK is we have no capacity to get any of that, any of that gear up there. So anytime any one of our industries, any one of our companies want to get something into space, we're now behind the queue on a, on a secondary ride on a Russian rocket or an or a, or American rocket or a European rocket, um, as it were, begging for space and certainly having no control of when or where that's going to launch. Uh, and, and all of our missions, um, I think my colleagues in the industry would agree, are sub-optimized by the fact that we can't command that launch. And so uh, the UK has a, a target to grow our industry, but the key thing in driving that growth is we need somewhere to command our own launch from. Um, there are some interesting pictures there, and you see the sorts of craft that we're talking about with the, spa with, uh, with the spaceport. We're talking about horizontal takeoff uh, space payload deployment systems. So uh, the archetypal one that many of you will probably be aware of, and I'll show some video a bit later, is the Skylon program, massive piece of absolutely strategic, game-changing technology. Um, but simpler systems, Virgin Galactic, um, XCOR with their small uh, two-seater spacecraft, companies like Generation Orbit, simple conventional engineering, rocket under, underneath a civil aircraft launching satellites to space. Um, those, are the sorts of, uh, those are the sorts of things that we're talking about doing, and that's the capability that we're looking to put in place. A bit about the competition. It started off as eight sites announced at Farnborough Air Show last July. Um, the MOD, as much as all the other sites, had no, had, had no sight of this list before it was announced. It was, it was developed behind closed doors by the UK Space Agency and the CAA and Department for Transport. Um, MOD couldn't release Kinloss and Lossiemouth into the program, and so those were withdrawn. Uh, Highlands Islands Airports Limited did not see it as being within their mandate to run Stornoway as a spaceport, and whilst they haven't said it couldn't be, they've said they won't bid. Um, Lucas was only made available by the MOD on a temporary basis. It's currently being used by the Army, and that lease will run out uh, early part of the 2020s, and after that they want to be able to use it for something else if they wish. So that takes that out really as an investable opportunity, which really leaves you with the four real contenders in the, in the mix. Uh, Campbelltown, uh, the McCohanish Airport, Airfield, uh, uh, Presswick, Lambeda on the foot of Snowdon, on the west coast of Wales and Newquay on the on the north uh, the northwest coast of of uh, Cornwall. 
And, and, and the process, by now, when it was announced, we should have already had a selection. The reality is, as all these things go, we're only going to start to get the bid process launched probably in November. But that's been a major benefit for us because it's allowed us to marshal all of the uh, preparations that are really necessary to put all of the benefits of not just Presswick, but actually industry and the agencies and the appetite of Scotland for this, pro for this project together. And we're now very well prepared for that bid when it happens. Um, one of the questions is, is it actually going to be a bid at all, or is it, is it just going to be a licensing process where they establish a license and we're able to bid for that? Um, we'll see. But what does this really mean to the Scottish space industry? Well, we have quite a developed space industry in Scotland. Um, it maybe is not all that uh, visible you know, in the daily record every day of the week or what have you, but, but it's there. We have uh, probably the world's uh, leading CubeSat uh, component and whole satellite developer in the form of Clyde Space based in Glasgow. Um, it, that's a completely strategic capability. Virtually every CubeSat in the world, uh, I'd hazard, will have some component drawn from Clyde Space's uh, uh, manufacturing. And with the advent of Spire, one of the, uh, 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 one of the US companies locating in Scotland alongside, uh, alongside Clyde Space, we have a real drive as a vehicle for getting uh, constellations and uh, satellite clusters into space. And there's a, there's a deep uh, pool of uh, other uh, industries and companies that are supporting this in components, in software, uh, we have a, a highly developed R&D community in our universities in Scotland. We have many companies involved in a whole range of different types of satellite services, instrumentation uh, at the, the highest levels of their industry, and, 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 and Steve will be speaking uh, from, from, from AstroSat later. But the big question is, well, where do we, you know, where do we get uh, all of this asset into space from? And how do we actually get it there? The, the, the hidden question in all of this that we've, we've uh, we found is actually it's not just about we don't have a spaceport, it's also that we don't have any space launch systems. And we've been putting the last year to good use uh, amongst the Presswick Aerospace and Aviation Industry uh, uh, cluster because in that cluster we have the ability to develop the capacity for space launch systems as well as at Presswick the capacity to have a space launch location. And uh, we're in the business now of, of, of basically setting up two brand new um, Scottish space entities. Um, and you see them there. Presswick Spaceport is, has been the, the project we've been working on to position Presswick for the spaceport. But Orbital Access is the company that we're setting up to integrate the aerospace capabilities of uh, the cluster at Presswick, along with American partners and foreign partners, to bring uh, a true brand new launch capability to Scotland. So, um, you know, we intend to command not only a location for space, but actually a whole service and a whole engineering uh, value for Scotland from this uh, opportunity. Um, and it's encouraging and, uh, and very pleasing to see the amount of support that we have, uh, that we have gained from uh, the Scottish Government and the Scottish agencies. Um, behind enabling and empowering and encouraging um, that growth. And, and I think if, uh, if anything attests to the visionary uh, role government has played in acquiring the airport, it is that they have, uh, by doing that, they've allowed these opportunities to live. Without that decision, these opportunities would not be here today. And Scotland really wouldn't have them at all. So what does it really mean? In terms of what we're doing at Presswick, we're, we're aiming to fill in those blue disks, you know, a space centre at Presswick, satellite launch capability, space tourism, um, space launch systems. So I call that the sort of new industry that we're building. But on the back of that, all of the other sectors that we are strong at in Scotland can grow. Uh, international customers will come to Scotland because they can get their, uh, their space services and products and solutions delivered in Scotland through a complete industry. And that's really what this is doing. It's bringing that complete industry to Scotland. And that means pounds. Don't ask me how many. There's a million economists that will give you a, a million answers. But it's not trivial. It's very strategic. 
I wanted to give you a little bit, just to end with a little bit of a visualization of the sort of things we mean. They sort of think, oh, space tourism in Scotland, what does that mean? But here's, a, here's just a little graphic um, of a flight path out of Presswick developed by XCOR for a space tourism flight. And, you know, if you imagine climbing to 102 kilometers in about, I don't know, a minute, less than a minute, um, uh, you know, that's the sort of thing we're talking about. Um, take off from Presswick, as soon as you get wheels up with four rocket, rocket engines firing behind you, uh, pull up, vertical, vertical ascent to 103,000 feet, just about above Elsa Craig, uh, and then a, uh, a period of weightlessness, uh, uh, looking at the view, which I imagine will be quite impressive, um, and then a rather exciting uh, descent, uh, five and a half G pull out, um, when, you, when you get to about 90,000 feet, that'll be quite, quite, quite good fun, I should imagine. And then, a, and then a, uh, you know, a flying cruise in to Presswick with a little bit of fuel on board if you, can, if you need to do another jet, uh, jet uh, turnaround, which could be, uh, could be quite amusing as well. Um, so there's a real product we can offer in Scotland. Um, you know, that gives you a little view of it. That's not, that's not pie in the sky. That's, that, that's been, that flight path has been through you know, Nats, for example, at Presswick. Um, they quite like the look of that. They can manage that. Uh, the, as, as a way of visualising what this really means, um, in, 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 in all of my research, I find nothing better than this video from Reaction Engines. And when you look at this video, there are a number of things to take away from this. Firstly, when you see the various ground sectors that are being displayed, imagine that's Presswick, and you don't find yourself thinking that's implausible. And when you look at the air sectors that, are, that you show in here, you're really going to see the range of the sorts of applications that we're talking about in this space industry. Virtually everything you see in this video could be done in Scotland, and much of it probably will.
So, an inspiring video because it really tells you all of the things that you know we're really working on in the space industry as a whole. And you know, the key thing for Presswick is here's a picture of Presswick in 1935, Scottish Aviation first hangar. That's what we started with at uh, at Presswick, and all of the industry, all of the products, all of the skills, all of the engineering achievements are taking us down a journey. And this is what we hope it could be in in a few years' time. And uh, you know, that's certainly that's certainly the dream that I'm working towards um, uh, a completely uh, new airport, if you like, but not losing anything of what it currently does, but adding so much more. So. Uh, that's the spaceport program. That's what we're fighting for. Thank you very much, Stuart. Nice to hear Scotland and the weather in a positive light for once. That's great. Um, our next uh, guest is the managing director of Stevenson Astrosat an organisation that prides itself on being at the forefront of the commercialisation of the space sector. An award-winning innovator, astrophysicist and space engineer. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Steve Lee. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stuart. Well, thanks very much. Um, it's a strange thing. <laughs> Stuart and I have been standing together in various panels and at space conferences for a long time. We've never actually spoke, just watch what each other is doing because it's so key. So I actually wanted to say thanks on behalf of the industry, certainly the downstream. I think that the leadership you're showing is incredible. I'm very proud of what you've been up to, so thank you very much. Um, now what Stuart was talking about was what's called the upstream right, in space. That's stuff that goes and flies in space. What Astrosat does is the downstream, which is stuff that comes from the stuff that flies up in space. My chief engineer calls what we do the midstream sometimes, because we do get involved in putting stuff up, but I don't like saying midstream when I'm in a talk, it makes me giggle. So, um, but yeah, I'm gonna talk about uh, something slightly different um, and how Astrosat is born and how we've grown to start using space and, and commercialize it. So during this talk, um, what I wanted to do is get a little bit personal as well. I, I think it's important there's some young people in the audience, there's maybe people that, that see what's happening in the industry and think they might have a stab at it themselves, and you should. You should definitely do it, and we're here to help you, guide you through it. So I thought I'd uh, tell you a bit of the story about how AstroSat got where it is, as well as um, describing a bit more about our products. I'm kind of going to announce something at the end as well, which has got me super excited. Um, and then I'm going to do something wildly stupid that if I had investors, they would hate me doing this AstroSat challenge thing. So um, I'll regret it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Who cares? It's Monday night. I'm going to start telling you about what space is. Okay? Space is very clever. That's the rocket man. He's an extremely intelligent guy. came up with the rocket equation that builds all our stuff to get it up there. And it's massively exciting. I mean, it's truly a joy to go to work in the space sector. It's a bit tough when you're doing bids for Innovate UK, but beyond that, it's really good fun. I mean, that's the guys celebrating, the, I think, the Philae lander or the Philae system waking up again. We've had experiences like that within our industry where you're waiting for the first signal from something that Craig's been spending 10 years on, and you get that little signal come through. Nothing beats it. It's distant and challenging as well. Uh, you can't read the text on this, but that's just a illustrate how vast it all is. It's a bit tricky when you're in this industry. You spend all this time building stuff and then most of the time you send it away. You never see it again. It's miles away. That little kind of blob there is the Earth and Moon from Saturn and the Earth and Moon from Mercury. So it's a weird industry. You're going to try and start up a little technology company. It's a bit hard to explain to people that we're going to take that on, those kind of distances. Um, it's also now available. And I'll get to what we did when we heard it was becoming available. Space is there for SMEs now. It's a huge opportunity for growing extremely exciting companies. It's also definitely that, right? <laughs> it's definitely that. Um, there's no denying it is pretty sexy. If, if we're talking about setting up companies, depending on the type of investor, if you get a 
if you get an investor that's bored of building hotels and things like that, it's quite easy to get some cash out of them. Because space is really sexy, it's really exciting. And it's an easy way to build a team as well. People, you know, I've got some of the best engineers I've ever known. And I work with some of the best engineers in Scotland and across the world. And they're all just driven every day to go and do cool stuff. That guy there, that's a real picture. He actually had it all set up when he was getting his... He'd probably worked for about 20 years to become an astronaut. And his wife let the dogs go just as they were taking his first astronaut picture. I love that. Nutter. This is what it's not, and this is something that's very, very important to me. I mean, it is rocket science. It takes a lot of Tchaikovsky equations and things to get the stuff up there. And you can see the design of that engine, for Sabre, the Sabre engines, it's nuts. But it's not rocket science. I, in my industry, we love that. We love saying, mm, it's rocket scientists and all that stuff. It makes us feel important. And I don't like it, because what it does is it distances our industry from the people that really matter, and that's the people back on Earth. So I don't like to use that phrase, and I don't like to try and talk about space as if it's something that is too far away from what we do every day. Because I fundamentally believe that that's what space is. It's no different than a bridge, a building, a railroad. It's just infrastructure. Okay, you guys probably got here. I know that my office manager got lost, so I bet she used her phone to figure out how to get here from GPS. That's because Crazy space heads put some stuff up there. GPS enabled how our cars run these days. It gets people in communications when they're far out of reach from telephone networks. It's simply just infrastructure. And fundamentally, it's there to help people on this planet. So we start talking about rocket science and we get too caught up in the, the sexiness of it. I mean, you can look at Matthew McCogney as long as you want. You won't get bored. But we've got to do stuff for the people on this planet. And also not just the people in the developed world that put the stuff up there, but we've got to cooperate across the Earth. AstroSat does an awful lot of work in the developing nations. And we do well out of it financially, but it makes us feel great. So that sense of it being infrastructure was what really drove me to, um, to set up AstroSat. This is the bit where I'm going to tell you a wee bit about, about the story of it. So when I realised that, that space was just infrastructure, I realised that there were certain ways we could build a business out of it. I figured that space needed startups. Okay, You'd be amazed at this, particularly seeing all the videos that Stuart showed you, but space is not very innovative. It's a very, very conservative industry. If you go into the space sector, it used to be like this about 10 years ago, and try and convince someone to change something, they don't like it at all at all. They're terrified. I mean, they've still got old dials and things from almost 60s era sent across an ESDEC and NASA. They just don't want to give it up. But a startup mentality is completely different in that way. So startup people don't really care what you tell them. They're just going to do it anyway. And space needed that. Space also needed that sense of innovation that an SME could drive. And these are kind of linked because when I was going to set up AstroSat, Nobody should want to be a startup. People in San Francisco love being startups. Being a startup sucks. It's horrible. You've got no money. Your crew can't get paid. You're probably working at your dad's kitchen. What you've got to do is you've got to get to being an SME as soon as you can. Then you take all that innovation and all that kind of nimble, quick moving stuff with you. And also, innovation is the thing that you need. So the space sector was starting to get really in trouble. It had been driven largely by kind of military industrial money for a long, long time. Big recession hit, space industry, I mean, we almost lost NASA. Things were starting to really get tight. And thankfully, people realized as much as space is a growing industry, which meant they needed fresh blood, they also realized that we had to commercialize it. We couldn't continue to just keep paying us at taxpayers' bills. If we're really going to use that infrastructure, we needed to make it a business. And that, again, required the growth of smaller companies, because this was all brand new to us all. And those companies, to break in and change space, needed to be highly innovative. So that kind of fit the bill for, for us, because we're Scottish and we just invent all the time. So this was a good opportunity. And what that drove me to do was set up AstroSat as a space services company with one core thing at its heart. Now, I love the space industry. I, I adore the people I work with, but I turn my back to them every day. AstroSat doesn't deal with the space industry. We go out and we look for problems out with, problems with infrastructure, problems with big problems, energy problems, city planning, disaster issues, building of roads, 
landslides, anything where somebody's faced with some kind of an engineering, societal or economic problem, we just want to get stuck in amongst it and let them tell us what the problems are. And then we adopt the AstroSat challenge and we try and find a space solution. So that's what AstroSat was there to do. It's to solve problems, not in the space world, on the planet Earth, for governments and big businesses, and then commercialise the use of the, the cool stuff that's up there. And in fact, there's another thing that kind of just got me going on this one. This work is a bit personal, but um, I've been thinking, I'd, I'd been wanting to start a space company for an awful long time. An awful long time. I'd been across in Boston for a while and come back to pretty much a desert as a physicist. You, you go into acad academia or you could go into the banks and that wasn't for me. I had all these ideas and inventions and I, I didn't know what to do. I wasn't actually very happy. And, uh, but I was happy at home and I had a beautiful wife and she came to me one day and said, it's great news honey, I'm, I'm pregnant. And I said, it's great news, we're going to start a space company. So this, that, was a pretty, that was my first sales pitch in the space industry. That was tricky. Really tricky. But actually, she kind of got it when I told her it was all about solving problems on the planet. And um, so she gave me nine months. Right? Nine months. TikTok. <laughs> and she said, you can, um, you've got nine months, honey, or you're either out or you're going to have to go and get a normal job. I'm sick and tired of this nonsense. <laughs> and Harry's on the way. So um, what I was also able to do is, when I was a student, I was a musician, a very bad one. But she, my wife said to me, you can go out, you've got nine months to turn AstroSat into something that can pay us and feed the wee man, um, and I'll let you go back to gigging if you want to do that. So I went out and started gigging around the clock, as I used to do when I was a student, and really rough pubs in Edinburgh, which is good, because if you want to expose yourself out with the space industry to normal problems, some of the pubs in Edinburgh have got a lot of problems. <laughs> so this was really good for me, but it also drove me to get going. So I was just on my own for about three to six months, but we nailed it. Now the plan had always been, don't think about solving big space things, find a problem in the world that we could solve. And the first invention that, that I came up with uh, was a product called Thermcert. I'll, I'll, I'll show you a picture of it soon. And what I basically did is I, I borrowed my dad's credit card and I bought a lot of infrared data off the Japanese Space Agency and used that infrared data, which was traditionally used to look at like, um, the sea temperature rising. And I figured out a way that we could tell municipalities where they had bits of their city that were emitting way too much heat and there's a law driving them having to fix that. So it was like a planning tool for municipalities to do thermal retrofits. It's really boring, right? But it's a space solution and it was a brilliant idea and it was a credit card allowed us to do that. Scottish Enterprise, I don't know if any of the AC crew are in here, realised that we were able to do something phenomenal in six months, which was make money out of space. So they came on board and gave me a little bit of seed money and that let me get my chief engineer in and it all kind of changed from then on. And the company has just grown from strength to strength, continually winning innovation prizes to kind of prove that that's our way of making sure the space sector doesn't kick us out because we're too small. We just innovate our way back in all the time. It really annoys them. I love it. And, um, and we've grown. So, you know, it started just myself playing really bad music and really bad pubs. My chief engineer, Alan, came on board. We started building a team. We're now up to about 14 people. There's 24 people distributed across the world working on our projects. And that's all in two and a half years. Now, I'm still gigging. You know, can't give that up. Uh, just as a hobby now. So, you know, if you haven't, I had an idea that we could start pushing the use of space technology that would allow us to grow. It was a tricky time to do it, but we got where we wanted to be, and it was a nice thing that, that you know, my wife got pregnant because it stopped me procrastinating and dreaming all the time. And that funny looking old building on the left is, is something we've just recently invested in. Uh, that's our headquarters. It's a church in Musselburgh. It used to be a really spooky doll museum. But we just bought that, and that's going to be one of the, certainly in Scotland, probably, I think, in, in Europe, if not the world, one of the first commercial um, Earth Observation Services mission control centres. It's really cool. So, and, and the other cool things, we sell an awful lot to <laughs> Americans and people in the Asian region, and they come across and see that, and they just, and that's older in America. So they come across and go, wow, this is so cool. Let's just get the deal. So talking about innovations and solving problems in space so that we can convert that into a growing business, I thought I'd give you just a few quick examples. Um, that's the Thermcert product. So there's an EU directive that, that nobody knows how to deal with. It's a law, and nobody's following it. 
where they've got to retrofit a, a municipality or a council is forced to retrofit buildings that are really thermally inefficient. And thermal inefficiency in buildings is not a good thing. It's killing the planet flat out. So these guys want to do this work. People in the, in the councils want to be able to solve this problem, but they don't have a clue what's going on in their cities. I mean, they go into a room and it's just full of EPC reports and it's a mess. So what we do is we use completely space-driven information and we create this funky little dashboard. And the lazy ones in the municipalities just click a button. It basically says, right, you've got 10 million to spend. Go here, here, and here. And that'll give you the biggest yield. So it's allowing people to deal with this EU directive. That's another little trick, by the way, for all you future SME growers. Find a law and solve a problem in that law. It's a good business case, even if you overprice it. Which we do overprice that. <laughs> but um, that's ThermCert. It's, uh, that was our first innovation prize that we got. That, that kind of lit the, the space industry. Who the hell's asked for that? But you know, we won a big uh, ESA innovation award and that let us get going. I'm very proud of that one. We're actually working on a European Space Agency project for that. You're going to see us driving about Edinburgh and Glasgow with a truck with some thermal cameras in the back. Don't throw anything at it. It doesn't. Look. It's a cool project. Um, we work. I primarily try and focus big infrastructure projects. It's the easiest to show a return on investment, and space is still quite expensive. So the next thing we came up with, again winning another prize that took our team up by about five, uh, was WaveCert. And what WaveCert was designed to do is we were speaking to the offshore renewable energy people that are, in fact, those are classic Scottish inventions there. They're tidal power systems. And there's a big investment up near Orkney, and again, Scotland solving this worldwide problem where we're going to start extracting energy from the tides. And, you know, you, you've seen wind turbines and stuff. And the big problem that that industry's got is they go out in these big gas-guzzling ships and, you know, 20 guys out there in danger to try and figure out where the best place to put them is. And to us, that was just nuts, because we were really good at playing with radar satellites. I'll tell you a bit more about that later on. And these radar satellites, you can actually look at the tidal flow, and then you can model what the tidal power would be underneath. So just by taking lots of pictures with German and Italian satellites, we can show them where the best place to at least go and look. So rather than go out and just scan an entire area, they can maybe only go out and scan two or three areas. It saves them a fortune. So that's, that wave search also um, grown to solve other problems, particularly in the, the fisheries industry, and to do with sediment outpour when they're dredging up ports. It's one of our most popular products. Third one, this is us starting to get into major infrastructure. It's a thing called uh, Transport Century. That was our third big prize. Um, this one's about literally being able to tell people, well, it, does anyone live up on the west coast of Scotland? Or has anyone ever gone across the rest and be thankful? Right? You get stuck all the time, every winter. Every winter, right? it, it gets blocked. And we realised that that's, I mean, it's ridiculous that we can't solve that in our own country. It's the same spot that keeps falling apart. But that's a bigger problem in the developing nations. So in Nepal, for example, when they had that terrific earthquake, um, horrific earthquake, um, satellites are able to pick up in millimetre accuracy any change in the ground. But the problem that the industry was facing was that to take an image of just a tiny, I think, I'm not sure where that is, I think it's somewhere in Italy, um, but to take an image of a whole road and, and check it after a storm to see if it's been blocked by a landslide or if it's all cracked apart, it's really expensive. It's like 16 grand for each one of those images. So that's a lot of money just to take one image. So what we did is the, the space industry told us of that problem. We had people all over the world saying, could you tell us when our roads are blocked rather than waiting for somebody to be stranded and phone in? And what we did is we, we kind of combined the two there. So we use optical and larger radar scans to pinpoint hotspots where there's more likelihood of something happening if there's a bad earthquake or if, even if there's a bad monsoon. And then when that event is triggered, we only scan those little spots. So we've made, we knew we could do transport, infra, uh, transport infrastructure mapping from space, but we found out a pretty nifty way to make it economical as well. And this is now getting sold into primarily Nepal, India, and um, I, think, <laughs> I think they're going to use it in Sunderland as well, which is climb a big building and look, man. But 
Um, it's, a, it's a great project. And what it also started to get us into, again, this, was, this is what happens if, if you're innovative, is we, we started working on this problem to solve a, an issue with roads. And we were speaking to um, South Africa and Vietnamese governments and a group in the New Forest, I think, I can't remember the details, it was someone in the south coast of England. And they said that they were still um, scanning for coastal erosion with lasers out in boats. And we thought, well, that's ridiculous. Why would you want to do that? It's freezing cold. And, and we, we did a quick project with the UK Space Agency and proved that we could also pick up coastal erosion from space. So we're saving an awful lot of geophysicists, a lot of cold, wintry, rubbishy nights. But it's great in the developing nations where maybe their tourism industry is based around nice long drives around the coast. So we're able to kind of monitor all that stuff. It's a real human safety element. That's, that's one of my favourites. Um, Exude, that's our new one. So uh, I was in India pitching to the Indian government about disaster relief. And we asked them what their main problems they had that economically we could solve. And this fantastic, I'm not going to do the accent, embarrass myself, but this fantastic guy turned around and said, they're sick and tired of getting maps, and fundamentally they need to sort out their flooding. So, I mean, India gets hit with monsoons all at well, every season. And they don't, every single season, their, their, their infrastructure is getting wrecked. And that's because when they call space agencies up and ask for images of the flood, they just send them these, these maps. It's no use. So what we decided to do was come up with a system that monitors how quickly a flood will dissipate or grow, and then overlay on that the infrastructure. So if they tell us that they've invested in a flood drainage system that can remove 10,000 litres, and it's not from space, then there's maybe a blockage in there. Go out and fix that. Or if there's one region where, particularly along a, a major route, say to your hospitals, is continually getting blocked, that's where you want to invest in a better bit of flood infrastructure. So this has just won this year's Copernicus Masters and we've got it getting developed in, in the church near enough and it should be going out into India and again getting tested in Sunderland. Yeah. So that's, that's Exude. This one's cool. This is just to show that we don't always do stuff um, based on Earth observation. Uh, this is Winter Vision and we came up with this idea by watching that horrendous show. <laughs> and it's awful. I was watching it on Discovery. I think it was tired on something. I thought, what's going on? And friends of ours live in Latvia, and they've got a nice road that forms. And people, it's very dangerous, right? If you've seen the show, people are driving across literally a body of water that's frozen. And it, it happens in Scotland with heavy, heavy snow as well, in Canada quite a lot. And they don't have any idea if they've gone off the road because it's all covered over. You see those things if you're going across, or if you're flying, you know, driving up to Fort William, those little markers that stick out the side of the road. Yeah, it's great engineering that when it's heavy winds and stuff. So they just fall down. No one knows where they're driving. So we came up with this system that, that uses very precise GPS matched with um, ice thickness scanning called Winter Vision. We're still building that, incidentally. So if there's any app developers around that could help us with that, there's a couple of jobs on the go. Um, all of this came together in something very recently for us, which we're extremely proud of. Um, so we developed quite diverse layers all over the place, all these different layers attacking different problems in different fields of infrastructure. And what we realized was that um, disaster mitigation was really getting under service, particularly in the developing world. We have a wonderful thing in the space industry, it's true collaboration, a thing called a disaster charter. But it's, um, it's run off basically charity and budget, so it's not done effectively. They need a hell of a lot more in the Asian region and South America. So what we did is we pulled together all of our layers into this system called RAPID, which stands for Recovery and Protection and Disaster. And then we go out to developing worlds and we say to them, which one of these layers do you want? Pick and mix. And we stick it all together into a dashboard and we start helping them be more resilient against disasters and then helping them recover. But we do it because we target major holes in their economy, which means we can fix those holes and charge, say, 5% which is probably about 10 times the budget for the existing disaster charter in each disaster. So we're kind of reworking the whole process of solving the world's problems with RAPID. The UK Space Agency uh, gave us a big award and paid for a fair chunk of that development. And we're really pleased with that product. It's going extremely well. My chief engineer is just back from Malaysia and Thailand. He was over there when the bomb went off, which was a horrible day, and then <laughs> bravely dusted himself off and went to Malaysia the next day and sold RAPID. 
which I'm very proud of. He's a bit of a nutter, but I'm very proud of him. So that's just a, a cross spectrum of, of some of the innovation layers that we've built that have helped us grow this business. And now we've got to talk about what's next. So this is probably one of the most exciting things that's happening to AstroSat and to, as a perfect example of Scottish collaboration right now. Um, we were um, approached, they came to us, um, a, a group that's run, working on behalf of NASA, to say we're putting a camera up on the space station, that's it there, it's just a tile, the space station's not disappeared, that would be attached to the bottom of the space station. And um, we need a company that's innovative, that thinks about new ways of using space data to do the payload engineering. And I acted super cool, a big smile, jumping about, texting everybody. I said, yeah, of course we can do that. And that's going to be going up next August. You guys are actually the first public people to hear about that. Now, what's really cool about that, that's massive for AstroSat. It's hot swappable cameras. So each one of these little cameras here, they can be pulled out, brought back into the space station with the robotic arm, tweaked around with or replaced, or you could even have it that you're just testing out a new bit of technology. You stick it up there for three months, prove that it works, swap it about again, and then you let another bit of technology run that you can maybe make some money with. We're looking to maybe probably extend that, make three of them up in the space station. So that's AstroSat's first big step into the upstream which is very important to us because very much like Stuart's argument that we're reliant on everyone else, so is AstroSat, so is the downstream. A lot, in fact, all of our data comes from sources in Europe and in America and Japan. There's only one group um, based at Surrey that we buy stuff off. Spire, we're getting stuff off as well. But I don't feel happy about this huge potential to grow our space industry in the downstream without feeling that we have some control of the upstream. It's exactly the same argument Stuart's got for us having launchers. I also wouldn't have been able to and wouldn't have felt confident enough to have said yes to NASA. You don't say yes to NASA if it's not going to work. They've got laser beams. <laughs> um, but I felt really confident saying that, that yes, AstroSat could do this. And I felt confident because we are pretty good at doing this downstream stuff. But also, I knew that right behind me, in Scotland, there was the perfect group of people to go to. I went to them the next again day, like a kid in a candy store, very excited. But I knew that just up on top of the Blackford Hill, next to the observatory, there's a group called the Astronomy Technology Centre, the best in the world at building imagers. A couple of the guys are here. So I knew that they could build, innovate, work with us to solve any of these camera designs that were needed to solve the problems NASA had. I also knew that the University of Strathclyde have, I, in my opinion, the best space university as well. So we could collaborate with them. They could help us on the systems engineering, some of the electronics that's got to be developed. They, could, they also contribute a lot of ideas that we haven't come up with. So we formed this consortia that we then went back to NASA with that solved all their problems in a matter of weeks. And we're only able to do that because of the Scottish space sector, because we're all friends, we all respect each other, and we've been given enough opportunities to work together. So before I do this ridiculous thing to prove that we can innovate on the fly, just imagine this happening. So this is going to go up, and we're probably going to replenish the, the lenses and the cameras every six months on every supply mission. What's going to happen is we're going to get a request from Malaysia to do some kind of tree, illegal tree logging, and they need it done quick because there's a new group of people stealing all their wood, and it's killing their economy. We tell NASA about it, and they go, definitely, this fits the bill. We then go to the ATC, which is just in Edinburgh, and say, we need you to tweak that multispectral camera, put these filters on it, tune them to the right band really quick. They do that. They deliver it to us. We then take it to Clyde Space in Glasgow. Clyde Space put one of their components from the CubeSats on it, makes it off the shelf. They've got a big production line. It's then shipped to Presswick, goes on the back of a Skylon, up to the space station and it's live within six months and we could be continuing to do that like a space production processing line all along the M8 in Scotland. Now, uh, there will be support from, from England, Wales and Northern Ireland and Ireland as well of course but the fact is we've built a kind of local economy and a local infrastructure to do that kind of stuff. So AstroSat's going to continue to provide economy saving solutions to the rest of the world, hopefully life-saving sometimes as well. But we're also going to be working with all the partners in Scotland to make sure that there's a salt tower on the space station.
and I'm definitely sneaking it on. It might be on the bottom. You're not supposed to have non-national flags, but I'll put it on, I promise you. Um, so before we go to the q and I think I've got just enough time left, um, let's have a stab at the AstroSat challenge, right? I should put a countdown clock up. I'm probably going to screw it up. If I do, we'll put something up on Twitter. But what I want you guys to do is, I don't know, see how quickly we can do it. So come up with a business problem or an economic problem or a societal problem and I'll try and not make a moopsie, and I'll try and figure it out and give you the solution. So go for it. Who wants to go first? Right, go. Uh, sun pollution in cities. Sun pollution. Sound pollution. Sound pollution in cities. Right. <laughs> um, right. All right. <laughs> OK, got you. So pivotal to that is going to be a city model. Right, a, a digital urban model. And again, that's something that you can derive from space very quickly. If you wanted to go into a city and you'd probably get sound pollution around a construction site, you want to quickly map that city so that you can plug in sound models and, and see the impact on it. Furthermore, you can use, there's a brilliant company called RootMonkey that, and there's fantastic technology in Glasgow through a company called Dynamically Loaded that can do traffic monitoring in real time so you could overlay, and in um, fact, people moving and things like that. So you could collect, and that's driven by GPS. So there's a GPS asset, there's your brand new space model that tells you what the city looks like, all piped into some clever acoustic model. So space gets in there a wee bit, all right? Let's check it on. Next, up there. And could you use space to solve the space junk problem? Oh, yeah, read my PhD thesis. <laughs> oh, I get the damn thing done, right? So the space space junk's a real problem. Okay, it's it's. I was talking to people before I started. It's basically um, there's a lot of space in space, but our orbits are always in the same places. It's like the, there's basically a just the M25 completely jam packed. People have been putting too much stuff up and not deorbiting it. I can't remember the exact details. But Malcolm knows it. But if we stop launching now and do nothing about getting rid of the space junk. I think it's 25 years, isn't it, Well, Within 25 years, we won't have anything. No GPS, no TV. There'll be a gravity situation without Sandra Bullock screaming, and all of it will go, right, because of a cascade effect. So that's space junk, and it's a major problem. And my industry is making it worse. We're polluting. It's the only place we're polluting rather than mitigating. And the biggest problem that we're facing, and I'm working on this with the University of Strathclyde, is that there's a lot of small satellites going up, extremely valuable. Small satellites run out of power in a heartbeat, not like the big boys that you can kind of repower and you know what's happening. They'll just stop talking to you, like a moody girlfriend. Um, so these small satellites are spinning around the Earth, and they're tiny, they're a little bit fragile, and they run out of power. When they run out of power, they can't communicate with the Earth. We don't know where they, where they are. Right? They also tumble a bit more, they get dragged out. It's very hard to predict where they're going to be. And also, the traditional route of tracking when power fails is bouncing radars up from the ground. The small satellites are too small for that. So small satellite space debris is something that we've got a real problem with. And we came up with this thing called the flux capacitor. Yes. <laughs> Love that. Um, 1.21 gigawatts was what we had to raise in the thing. What it basically does is we, 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 we're working on basically an RFID tag, effectively, that will be about the size of a stamp, and it will stick on the bottom of a small satellite, and it actually charges itself off the energy that's getting beamed down from the big geostationary satellites and the GPS constellations and Iridium, so that even if the power fails in a small satellite, maybe once in orbit, maybe once every four orbits, it will send a tiny little signal down that would still allow us to track it. So that's Scotland's small step towards space debris mitigation. There's bigger steps and better inventions happening in Strathclyde where they're working on deployable solar sails. So it's just remember when you were a kid and you used to lean from your jacket in the wind? They'll do that with the solar wind and it'll drag the satellites back down. So it's definitely a problem that my industry has to solve and we're working on it. But we can't stop launching big satellites. OK, one more, Earth-based. Oh, brilliant. Um, yeah, that's a beauty. Yeah, we're working on that. 
I mean, there's, mass, there's a lot of elements to megacities that you've got to look into. Food scarcity, I think, is one. So there's a lot of agricultural technology can come from earth observation. We need to do things like check that the land has enough moisture in it, do an elevation map so that when they put the infrastructure for getting water to them, it's there. Mega cities are going to be bad polluters, so we'll use Thermcert. Um, we'll use solar irradiance so that we can look at their potential to go off the grid. Uh, land stability is also going to be a big thing. I mean, they're building mega cities in the Middle East. I, I, waste disposal as well would be a major problem. Excuse me? Waste disposal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a big one. Um, there's sensors for methane going up, so we could maybe test if they're working or not. They're their disposal, but um, it's all about giving them tools to plan their infrastructure, and they're building these mega cities in places that aren't very tectonically stable, and and that's something that AstroSat's pretty good at as well. So you can use radar, and you can map their land deformation stability down to millimetre accuracy. So it's less about it's about giving the guys that are going to invest in this stuff the right information before they dig into the ground. And um, the other thing we've got is a system called RoofWatch which deals with, um, when it, imagine a, a big storm. I invented this, actually, I was playing a gig and I looked out of, it was a really quiet gig, I looked out the window and I saw that there was a, a building down the, down the way that the roof tiles had all peeled up. And I was really worried it was winter. I knew that the next big bit of wind would knock them off. It's very dangerous. So we invented this thing called Roof Watch. And it works perfectly in a mega city environment where if there's bad weather or a bad storm, you can't have people going up on the roofs and checking every major skyscraper. So what we do is we scan it with radar and we look for change detection. And we say, that roof's okay, you better go fix this one. So there's, there's lots of things that we can get into future cities. That's going to be a big boom sector. If you want to start up a space company, start up a future city space company. Do you want to do one more? Have we got enough time? We're pushing it a little bit. We're going on to Q&A now, so um, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Steve and Stuart. Thank you. That was fascinating. Um, can I just remind everybody before the question and answer session that okay. um, if you would ask your questions in the microphone, because we are uh, recording tonight's, uh, tonight's talk. So, who's first? Questions? This one up there. Oh, can you hear me? Go. Mm -hmm. uh, this one's for uh, Stuart. Uh, what engagement have you had with the local community down at Presswick with uh, louder aircraft, one horizontal takeoff for noise abatement, sonic boom? Um, uh, I suppose the, the, we're a little bit early in terms of being able to model really detailed um, you know, environmental noise impacts. Uh, the Broadly speaking, the types of aircraft that we're going to see in any reasonable near term are likely to be conventional civil aircraft carrying deployed uh, launch systems. So, for example, a generation orbit based DC-10 carrying a 450 kilogram payload uh, rocket is actually just going to take off as a normal civil aircraft and it'll fly out to uh, somewhere north of the uh, the Hebrides and, and, and put, out a, put, out, put up a polar satellite um, you know, way out in the ocean. So you're going to see um, very little change to the noise characteristics around the airport. Um, a aircraft like XCOR with four small rocket motors um, is going to produce a noise envelope far less than Concord, who we thoroughly enjoyed having uh, doing flight testing at Presswick while it was uh, and, and pilot training at Presswick. So, um, yes, when we get into vehicles like, uh, like Skylon in 25, 30 years' time, then clearly that's going to be a significantly uh, bigger challenge. That's a, you know, that's a, you know, th those engines are, are really big uh, engines firing in rocket mode on takeoff. So there's certainly going to have to be a little bit of forewarning uh, for that type of operation to, to, uh, to take place. I mean, I think the, the reality is I, I, I like to talk probably um, hopefully uh, fairly on behalf of the Presswick uh, people. We, we like the sound of rocket engines and, and, and aero engines. It says our industry's working. It says uh, we've got an economy that's working. And as long as we uh, protect our uh, airport surroundings and we don't um, do a sort of uh, 
Clyde side shipyard story when we where we build our houses right on the edge of our the edge of the airport, then I think we can create a very a very good environment in the long run between the aerospace and space activities at the airport and the community around it. Okay, uh, next question, just over there, please. Scotland's pretty far north, latitude-wise. I wonder if you can comment on the economics of launching from Scotland versus somewhere on the equator where you get a higher velocity for orbiting. Uh, is, that a, is that an economic debit? And what's it cost? Um, I, I'm, it's probably mine again. Yeah. The, um, I, I think the reality is that there, are, there is a need to uh, launch into a whole variety of orbits. And, uh, you know, Scotland in particular is well suited to uh, polar and sun synchronous launches uh, where indeed its economics are far better than such launches from uh, equatorial optimized sites. So there's a, se a whole sector of the market which, which uh, Presswick Scotland is actually better placed than the, than the main plethora of uh, space launch locations in the US. Uh, even uh, you know, retrograde, retrograde orbits out of Presswick are, are, are going to be an attractive option, uh, mainly mainly for military purposes, perhaps. But uh, you know, we're certainly, in terms of launch services, going to have to collaborate uh, with spaceports in other locations to get, you know, good uh, geostationary um, you know, uh, launch trajectories. So, uh, I think the we have to view Presswick as a geographic location, or Scotland as a geographic location that suits a, a certain spectrum of the. Uh, of, of, the, uh, of the launch market, but not certainly the whole. And there are some markets that are going to be more optimally served from Presswick than from other places. Mm. That's also to take yeah. into account the space tourism element, which will come yeah. later on. Yeah. Scotland's a nicer place to look at in the Mojave Desert. I mean, that's, that's a fact, and you can golf when you're hanging around it yeah. the other side. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Who's any other questions? The gentleman here, please. Thank you. There's another one for uh, Stuart. You mentioned that uh, Lambeda uh, and Newquay were um, amongst the principal candidates for a, a spaceport. Could you expand more on what may, would make, in your opinion, Prestwick the best bet of those three? Oh, well, I couldn't have. I couldn't have placed that question better, could I? Um, <laughs> the uh, uh, yeah. I suppose I spent the last year, you know, working on the answer to that very question. I think. The, um, if, we, if we strip it down first to the specific technical requirements um, that have to be met for space, uh, you know, for, for, a, for a site to be good for space launch, I think the very first thing is uh, you need to be able to command uh, visual meteorological conditions, i.e. VMC conditions, such that uh, the craft that are flying can fly under visual flight rules. And the reason that's necessary is because there are plenty of additional technical risks that the aircraft and the systems are having to accommodate. And uh, to rule out the weather risk is an absolutely key element of, uh, of a site. Um, so weather is the very first, uh, first issue. We, we have done some, uh, we have received some analysis from the Met Office. Uh, and I, I use that, those words because it's not Presswick's analysis, it's the Met Office's analysis. Um, at Presswick, you get around 11% uh, of meteorological observations show a cloud base under 1,500 feet, which would be a classic um, you know, delineator for uh, VMC conditions. At, in Newquay, you get over 30% of observations show a cloud base below 1,500 feet. So we're uh, three times better than, uh, than Lambetta, indeed better than all the other sites. Uh, the same basic equation applies to crosswind prevalence on the runway, applies to uh, uh, visibility conditions. Um, so the, uh, the, the reality is that the Presswick weather is the best and the Met Office uh, long-term hi history uh, demonstrates that beyond debate. Um, that deals with the basic issue. You then get into basic infrastructure. The uh, airfield at Presswick was built uh, through an enormous amount of wartime investment during the 19, uh, late 19, 1930s, early 1940s, during the war. And it was built because it became the 
uh, again, because of the weather, uh, became the primary place for North American built air assets to enter the European war theatre. And uh, I think I'm right in saying that, that Presswick during the war years handled some 57,000 aircraft movements. Um, and the infrastructure required to accommodate those air movements is what creates the foundation of that airfield today. Three kilometer, 60 meter wide, concrete based uh, main runway. Um, second only, I think, to Gatwick and Heathrow in the UK uh, in terms of its construction and its, and its weight handling capability. Um, an enormous runway. But it's not just the runway, it's the concrete aprons that were built during the war to handle those aircraft, which still sit there today under the cross runway, under all the hard standing next to those runways. Those are, uh, those are now encomp encompassing taxiways and so on. So that infrastructure is unique. All of the other airfields in the UK competition are what I would describe as Cold War airfields, single squadron RAF uh, airfields. RAF Morgan, which is new key, is an old Vulcan bomber airfield uh, designed and built for that purpose. It's the runway length is designed for that aircraft. The, the structure of the airfield is designed for those military operations. The same applies to all of the other, uh, all the other airfields. Matkahanish is also a Vulcan bomber base, if I recall. So the, um, those, those pieces of infrastructure do not benefit from the sort of investment that Presswick has. The airfield is, and that's particularly important when you're talking about loading oxidizer, liquid oxygen, uh, onto spacecraft. You drop that onto asphalt, you get, you, get a, you get a flammable mix. So you have to be able to prepare areas that are concrete, uh, in a concrete surface, non-interactive. Non Presswick has the benefit that whilst it's currently skimmed with asphalt for ease of maintenance, uh, preparing areas for, to take it back to the original whole concrete, it readily easily done at very low cost. Um, so uh, Presswick has the infrastructure, <coughs> the basic underpinning infrastructure that none of the other sites have. It also has the benefit that all of it is in full present operational condition. None of it's mothballed. Kahanish has a long runway, but only half of it is used and only half of it is maintained, for example. Um, so it's in service. Those deal with some of the practical realities of it. More importantly, perhaps than those, or certainly as importantly as those, are the economic opportunities of, of this, of, of Presswick as compared to the others. Um, we did some uh, population statistics to look at the uh, population within a two hour driving circle of each of the airfields. Presswick commands virtually the entire central belt of Scotland, about four million population. Um, Macrohanish, um, stand fast the 20 people that can fly each day on a twin otter out of Glasgow. The, the rest are looking at a two, three hour journey to get just to Glasgow. So you've got less than, uh, less than I think it was less than 400,000 odd for, for Macrohanish. Interestingly, you look at Newquay, You've only got about a million population in access to Newquay, a four to one um, reduction in comparison to Presswick. So Presswick has by far and away the, the broadest population access. And that translates into a whole variety of, of, of key issues, access to skills, access to, uh, to, to footfall at the, at the airport in terms of the, the sort of visitors that you might command and so on. So uh, as an economic prospect, that population radius is, is critical. But then of course you realize that you can actually get off the rail network at Presswick. You can get off the motorway network at Presswick. Um, you can't do that at any of these other locations. Lambeda is at the foot of, I don't know if anybody's been to, to Lambeda to the west coast, of, west coast of Wales. I've been there once. Um, you know, it's a decent hike down. You know, you go to Anglesey, that's a, that's a, a, you know, a bit of a track. Then you sort of head back down, head down from uh, Bangor to Portma Dog. You go down, you finally get down under the, under the foot of Snowdon and you finally get down uh, you know, to the coast at Lambeda. There really isn't, nothing, isn't anything there. Um, the concept of building a burgeoning space industry at Lambeda is, uh, you know, beyond imagination in my view. Um, at Newquay, the weather, the reason they have the cloud-based problem is because they sit right in the, in the prevailing flow from the, you know, from the, uh, the, south, the southeasterly prevailing, prevailing wind from the Caribbean. Every morning it is cloudy at least to midday, uh, potentially to one o'clock then everybody's out on the, on, the, on the beach. But hang on, you've got to fly spacecraft at that point too. The weather compresses everything. All the activities in UK into the one weather window. That's a real problem. Um, I don't think there's a single factor in the spaceport um, competition 
that uh, Prestwick doesn't prevail upon. And I think prevailing. I think the, the biggest one, I think, is actually the industry. It, it comes down to uh, the fact that when you're, if you're trying to be a spaceport, you're actually trying to deal with complex systems, integrate complex uh, payloads into sophisticated uh, you know, air systems. That requires serious skills. And Prestwick's the only place that has those skills, you know, developed from you know, three or four generations now even uh, of, uh, you know, of, of engineers and people in the community. You, know, you, can't, uh, you, you can't add up those uh, factors and find even half of them at any of the other places. Okay. Sorry, that's a little okay. bit of a long no, answer. That's a very comprehensive answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We've got time for one more question. And gentleman there. This is a question for Steve. Steve, you mentioned the Rapid project. Um, on a real-time basis, how will that enhance support for a country that is suffering a disaster? Um, it's all designed to be real-time. Um, the real-time will get better. Rapid integrates multiple sources of satellites. Uh, so does the disaster charter, but it, it's still limited. So Rapid's going out because it's a commercial system and pulling in everybody's satellite feed, everyone we're allowed to. Um, so that will implicitly provide greater coverage. We also have clever technology that means that you don't have to use the same sensors. So you might get Nepal telling you they want a, a ground uh, scan for stability damn quick and the next Sentinel mission comes over two hours, we get that. Then we take the next feed from one of the Italian satellites and the guys in the office know how to fuse them together. So real time is the key. Uh, but we also, there's a non real time element which is about using year round and archive scans to build more resilience as well. And the final thing is um, with, the, with the real time argument, just to give an example, N Nepal really get hit right now with, with problems with quakes. We've seen one big one, but there's smaller ones all the time. And nobody has yet has baselined their country for radar. If it, if it was baselined with a nice economic model, then you would be able to do change detection the next time a, a radar satellite comes over. So it's definitely one we're, we're going to try and solve. Thank you, Steve. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please show your appreciation for Stuart McIntyre and Steve Lee? Thank you. <laughs> You're the reason we're going to get this. And just, just one other thing um, for anybody that's interested. Our next, in, uh, our next innovation nation talk is uh, called innovation nation innovation light, uh, which is on the 26th of November, and we have Professor Rory Duncan and Dr. Paul Delgarno from Harriet Watt speaking at that. So that's one for your diaries. Thank you very much.